Hi, everyone. Welcome to the show. Today, I have with me Tim Harris, who is a professional EOS implementer. And welcome to the show, Tim. Hey, Mark. Thanks for having me. Looking forward to it. Good to be here with you. And you have just such a unique story about how you got here. So I'm looking forward to the conversation. So let's just dive in. Let Tell us your story. How did you come to become an EOS implementer? Okay, so I'll rewind a little um, back to my early career. Um, I, I got a degree in land management with a view to becoming what's called over here a chartered surveyor, which is a property term. Um, when you say over here, where do you mean I'm sorry, exactly? Sorry, I'm in the UK. I, yep. Sorry, yeah, that wasn't clear. I'm in the UK. So uh, I was going to become uh, a chartered surveyor um my father was one one of my brothers was also one um and without any other great calling i thought i'd start there um there was a recession when i came out of university and property uh, was on its knees um, my eldest brother meanwhile was making a lot of money trading so i followed the dollar and um I became a trader, uh, so I then started um, a pretty natural career progression, right? From a chartered surveyor to a government bond option trader. Um, it's a well-trodden path, right? Right, it's on so, property, really. <laughs> I started trading Italian government bond options uh, backed by a Dutch merchant bank. Um, couldn't handle the stress, hated running positions over weekends. Um, you know, at the time, uh, I think it, Italy had had 55 prime ministers since the Second World War and the, the, barely a weekend went past where someone in the Italian cabinet wasn't up to no good. So um, it was a pretty volatile product. Um, so uh, I left the trading scene um, at the same kind of time, uh, my mother uh, sadly passed away from a disease called lupus, uh, which is an autoimmune disease. Um, I was very close to her. Uh, I didn't handle it very well. Uh, as with most things back then, if I wasn't liking the situation I was in, I pretty much turned to alcohol. Uh, and uh, there were too many painful memories around uh, just after her death uh, in the UK. And so having obviously having at that age not worked out that you can't just run away from your problems. I tried to run away from my problems. So I looked for a job in Sydney, couldn't find one, found a job in Singapore as an oil broker. Mm -hmm. uh, so I went over there for about six months. Uh, didn't enjoy that, wasn't very good at it either. Um, uh, came back to the UK uh, and the guy that had initially hired me um, took me uh, to the UK arm of another oil broken company. Uh, and I stuck with oil for 24 years after that. Um, Both stuck. <laughs> yeah, but during that 24 years, um, I had two breaks from burnout. Mm -hmm. um, clearly didn't listen to my body and after each one went straight back into the same industry. Uh, and um, I managed finally about four years ago as I was approaching my third burnout to start listening to my body uh, and my family. Uh, so I exited that industry, having been global head of uh, that department for 12 years. Uh, mm -hmm. the, the stress, basically the juice no longer became worth the squeeze. Sir. Sure. Um, I, uh, I was an absent dad. Uh, I was an absent husband. Uh, very reliant on alcohol, not, not an alcoholic, but kind of a functioning alcoholic. 
Mm -hmm. um, and yeah, it was yeah not a great way to be living. So um, I got out, which is great, um, I, and I will I will never regret that because I've had three to four fantastic years uh, reconnecting with the family, spending a lot of time with my kids, uh, reconnecting with my wife, uh, and. After I left the city, I retrained as a business and personal coach. Um, um, I got a, a business and coach, a business and personal coaching accreditation from the International Coaching Federation, the ICF. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, and my view was to go back into the city and try and help leaders like myself who were just crumbling under the pressure. Uh, mm -hmm reliant on alcohol or or other um, to get them by um, and there are so many of them and I did go back in and I coached several CEOs and it was pretty gratifying work but I didn't feel like I was making a big enough impact you know coaching one-on-one -on -one. Mm -hmm. and uh, I went to uh, I went to a workshop uh, called Living With Purpose where I met Brandon Harris. And um, for those of you that don't know, I'm sure you all do, Brandon is a, uh, an EOS implementer over here, has been for, I think, four years. Yep. Uh, and, and Brandon heard this story and took me aside and said, um, I'd like to introduce, introduce you to EOS because... I feel that I have enormous impact on people's lives. Mm -hmm. And I loved listening to the story of working with leadership teams who were potentially struggling or who wanted to grow, were frustrated, um, nothing was working. And um, I, I loved, I loved what he was saying. And also what I'd found with the coaching was that having been for 24 years in an industry that was contracting around me. So, and what I mean by that is it was getting more and more congested with other brokers and a mm -hmm. lot of the trading was going screen based and the product that we were broking was being regulated out of existence. It was kind of a perfect storm and we kind of squeezed the last life out of it. Mm -hmm. so, when I, so when I qualified as a coach, I was thinking, this is great. You know, you can never be the perfect coach. It's something I can work on forever. Um, and um, I thought there weren't that many actually out there. And I was very wrong. Uh, and it seemed, <laughs> that, it seemed that every other person I met was a coach. So when Brandon uh, mentioned EOS and said, oh, and by the way, there are only 16 of us in the UK, I just went, I'm in. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so that was, that was how I found EOS, but weirdly, and I love this part of the story after I did my coaching qualification, uh, I signed up for an endurance event because I felt like in those 24 years in the city, I had done nothing but push money around for people who, people whose values, um, no longer aligned with mine uh, and I hadn't actually created anything other than you know having a nice foundation for a good lifestyle with my own family uh, mm -hmm. so I signed up for this endurance event which was rowing unassisted across the Atlantic uh, from La Gomera in the Canaries to Antigua in the Caribbean uh, and that was a really interesting campaign. I met some fantastic people. But when I went back to speak to my coach, having found EOS, uh, the coach that taught us to row, um, he said, well, I used EOS in our training. I just never referred to it as EOS. And I, and I remember the training and he talked to us about our vision and our values and mm -hmm. literally right person, right seat. You know, we only had two seats in the boat. Um, and, yep. uh, and I love the fact that it's, it's kind of gone full circle. 
uh, and that effectively EOS got Simon, my partner and I across the Atlantic in a seven meter rowing boat. Uh, so yeah, I, love that. I mean, so I have a lot of questions about this. Yeah. <laughs> So you, you you spend all this time in the oil industry. You're getting beat down to the ground, uh, moving money around for other people. I'm sure you learned a lot through those experiences. Generally speaking, I'm sure you worked with a lot of um, entrepreneurial businesses and entrepreneurial minded people. And so you're you're wanting to transition out. You become a coach. And you're like, oh, I haven't really been doing much with my life. I'm going to sign up for a small little endurance event, uh, and I'm going to row across the Atlantic. I mean, most people would try like a 5K first. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, like maybe fun. start a little smaller uh, yeah. as opposed to rowing across the Atlantic. So you, what kind of boat is this? I mean, uh, how long did it take? Yeah. About that. So, so a bit of background there. Um, uh, I had been, I happened to have been watching this race for about, well, for 15 to 20 years. So it wasn't random. Um, okay. <laughs> uh, and, and I think each year I'd been watching it, it had maybe been percolating, you know, could I ever do that? Could I ever do that? And it was one of probably probably the only real epiphany of my life was December 2019, just before COVID. And I was miserable at work. And I'd had shingles twice that year, obviously a stress related ailment. Um, and actually one morning on the way to work, I was so stressed that I threw up on the train. Mm. And, um, and I finally thought, okay, there's not something's not right here um and i was thinking what i could do and then, and then that christmas it it literally just came to me the row i'm approaching 50 i was 49 at the time um and uh, it, it was just you know we talk about the matrix suddenly working and everything falling into place it was just one of those mm -hmm. moments that was it and i didn't even need to write down the pros and cons it was just it slotted straight into place. You're just going to row. Yeah. And um, so I signed up um, thinking that somebody would join me to make a pair because I didn't really want to do it on my own. And I, no. asked, <laughs> I asked 12 of my friends. And they, all and they didn't said, just jump on it like, yes, let's do that. <laughs> no. Literally, they're like, why would we do that? Um, <laughs> I mean, that's a perfectly rational response. <laughs> yeah. Um, and in the end, um, uh, I asked uh, a lovely man uh, who I hadn't known that long. He was the father of uh, one of the kids uh, in my in my kid's school. And we were in a pub one evening and, and um, it was a real throwaway comment. It was just, uh, hey, Simon, I don't suppose you want to row across the Atlantic, do you? And he just went, yeah, sure. <laughs> oh, uh, yeah. okay. And, and that was that. And, um, you know, and we, he's just one of life's good people. Um, he'd slot right into the EOS community. Um, we, we worked so well together and, uh, and we're, we're super close friends now. Um, you know, that's, it's a hell of a bonding experience, you know. When we, yeah, I bet. There's I just bet. That, there's just that knowing look when you see each other. Um, yeah. And you see, each I other, mean, you see each other stripped, I mean, literally stripped bare, but you see, you see each other mentally and physically yeah. stripped bare by the elements and at yeah. your lowest and at your highest. So it's a real privilege to, to share that experience with him. And, and it would have been so... Actually, saying that now makes me realize how how tough that must be on the solo rowers having nobody to share it with. Mm -hmm. But that's another challenge altogether. One which I haven't yeah. discounted. 
Um, so are you going to do it again? Is that what you're saying? I, I don't know. I, I think I'm looking through rose tinted glasses. I, you know, there are days, you know, with my abundance mindset, I remember the good, the good parts, Great. But, it, but it was, it was brutal. Oh, I bet. How, so how long did the road take? So, uh, 52 days it took us just under 52 days. So, mm -hmm. um, some quite good stats. I love these stats. So we worked out that we must have rode a million and a half strokes. Uh, we did 300 two hour rowing shifts back to back wow. without stopping. Um, through the night, uh, it was extraordinary. We, the sleep deprivation was un unbelievable. It was surreal. We were hallucinating. Um, genuinely, I mean, some of the other teams, they had stories of, you know, rowing and they, they could see tentacles coming over the side of the boat and trying to steal the oars. And some people were chatting with members of their family that they said they could genuinely see sitting opposite them. Um, for me, I kept seeing plates of, uh, fresh fruit and salad on the boat because I, <laughs> the food was so awful. Um, I really missed like fresh veg and fresh fruit and I would just see it, uh, like a mirage on deck and I would find myself scratching the deck. Um, Simon's was a bit more extreme. Simon. Okay. So Simon um he kept seeing hotels floating past so i'm guessing he wasn't enjoying the cabin uh, <laughs> the cabin it stank for a start it was about 40 degrees in the cabin during the day uh, and it was only two meters by a meter and a half wide so your legs wow. went your legs went into a tunnel and then your just your your waist and your torso and your head were in that one and a half meter by two meter space. So it was pretty claustrophobic. And you, you now was there like a boat that was following you that that you would sleep in at night and carry supplies and stuff, or are you out there by yourself? We so a bit of both. So um, to get the the badge of an unassisted crossing we had to be self-sufficient so mm -hmm. we took enough food we, we knew we'd be around 50 days um and the, the the regulations were that we had to take enough food for 65 days okay. um, and so there there were two sailing boats uh that were on the atlantic at the same time but you never knew where they would be and they quite often sailed near the back markers because they were the people you know that were perceived to have the biggest probability of a of a an issue mm -hmm. um so had we had an issue they could have been you know three or four days sail away from us oh so, geez <laughs> i mean that's not really close by <laughs> no it's not good but um, <laughs> but what happens is you have these emergency beacons called EPIRBs, um, and if, if there's a proper problem, you set the EPIRB off, and it's monitored globally, uh, and it and um, it's kind of the rules of the sea that the nearest boat to you has to come to your assistance. Mm -hmm. So last year, one of the boats capsized, and they couldn't. In fact, most of the boats capsized last year in storms. And one of them didn't write itself and uh, they got picked up by a passing tanker that was going from Nigeria to Quebec. Mm. So they ended up in Quebec and had to leave their boat floating upside down. Wow. Now, how many, how many boats were going at the same time? So uh, the year we did it, which was 21 into 22, there were 34 boats, I think. Okay. And see, how many made it? We didn't see any of them. Uh, oh wow! The the year we did it, thirty three made it. Okay. Uh, some were very late. Um, yeah. They, they sort of unofficially say that you need to come in inside of sixty days 
for it to count, but it's, you know, this, it's unofficial. It still counts if you make it. I mean, yeah, you made it. Yeah, I yeah. think, you know, yeah. um, <laughs> that counts. But yeah, we, I mean, there's some brutal stories. You know, one lady, um, you know, many, many years ago, she lost her rudder 200 miles from the finish. And so, you know, so had been rowing for two months and then couldn't finish. Um, one couple tried it and the husband bailed out within a week uh, and the wife carried on and rode it solo and they got divorced and it's quite a cool story. <laughs> well, I bet. <laughs> yeah. Um, can you imagine that? You know, him going, no. uh, darling, I don't like this. I'm getting out. Yeah, see ya. <laughs> Good luck to you. <laughs> so yeah, it's wow. great. The great thing, um, and it and it it re I mean, I now do quite a bit of public speaking uh, on the journey from you know through corporate life uh, to burnout to retraining as a coach to 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 the row uh, and now to EOS and. Um, it's a great story. We, we just learned so much about ourselves in, in that journey, in the whole campaign. But, but in the boat, we just learned so much about resilience, teamwork, perspective. Perspective in particular, um, we passed about 500 miles off the coast of Mauritania. We passed an empty migrant dinghy, uh, mm. just floating empty. And uh, the lifeguard has the lifeguard had told us before we left. The, sorry, the lifeguard, the coast guard, had told us before we left that if you see a migrant boat, you you must not approach them. And we saw this thingy, and we thought that that just that isn't right. That can't be right. How can we not approach to see if there's anyone, you know, lying down that we could give water to, or food to, or even take with us. Mm -hmm. As it happened, because of the currents and the winds, although it was probably only about 600 yards away from us, we couldn't have got to it because these rowing boats are, they're really slow. Yeah. And, and they're heavy and you can't row them into the waves or into the wind. Um, so, so we couldn't have got to the dinghy anyway, but it left us for a couple of days just reflecting so deeply on, on, you know, I think Warren Buffett called it the ovarian lottery. Mm -hmm. Just how lucky we are to, to be in the positions we are in. You know, our row was totally voluntary. We had water, we had food, we had communication, uh, and we had the choice. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, obviously you sit there and you see these dinghies and you think, wow, you know, they... Can you imagine being the father and knowing probably for a month that you're going to play r Russian roulette with your family's lives and scrape together enough money from your village, give it to a ruthless gang who are going to give you a dinghy that's probably full of holes and they're just going to push you off from the coast of Africa in the hope that you hit like that needle point that is the Canaries or the Azores. It's, it's almost certain death so yeah without dragging the tone down too much um it, it really it, it it made us feel very lucky yeah i bet i bet so you mentioned a, a quite a few lessons there in resilience and grit if you had to for someone listening to this and what were the top three lessons that you think came out of tackling such a a difficult, challenging experience, what would be those top three? So to me, easily the top three is that you always have more in the tank than you think you have. Mm -hmm. um, we constantly dug, we constantly thought we were done. We, we, we would, it's just, I cannot get up again and row I, I have nothing left mm -hmm. um, and 300 times we 
we managed to just find a way to get up. And a lot of it was to do with not wanting to let down, you know, your teammate. Right. You still have to do it. You know, you have to own it. You have to, you have to not make excuses mm -hmm. um, and, and just dig deep. And that's where things like seeing that dinghy really helped because it gave you perspective. And when, you, and when you're thinking, I've got nothing left, actually. You still got it. Yeah, we've got water, food, and the choice. Like, who am I to complain? It, you know, it was our choice to be here. So yeah, mm -hmm. we've always got more in the tank is, is my top one. Um, <clears throat> after that, I would say it is teamwork. Um, we, it's, it's really weird. Um, and we spoke about it right at the end of the row. We planned this for two years, this row, and we're, we're both empathetic guys. So we, you know, we, we said we should be okay on that front. You know, we'll, uh, I'll understand how you're feeling. Uh, and we said to each other, you know, we must talk if, if there's anything going on, you know, I need to know everything that's going on with you because it's just the two of us for two months. Mm -hmm. Um, but even with all that planning and all that intent to, to be honest with each other and tell each other when we were low, um, when it, when push came to shove, we couldn't, uh, because we just didn't want to let the other one down or, or let them think that we were a weak link. Mm -hmm. and I spoke to a, a polar explorer called Ben Saunders, who's the, the youngest man to have ever walked to both poles. Um, and he said that he and his partner had the same problem when they walked to the South Pole, that neither wanted to tell the other one how much they were hurting because, you know, they didn't, I don't know, I think they, you don't want, it's a bit like uh, new parents of children, you know, they, you don't want to let the other one know how much you're struggling because you know they're struggling too. Mm -hmm. But actually, what, what everybody needs is to be open and honest and vulnerable. And um, we, we worked that out on Christmas Day, which was about 13 days uh, into the trip because for all our planning we had got uh, we would become obsessed with not letting the other guy down and so we were just row eat sleep clean row eat sleep clean and there was hardly any communication we just passed each other on the deck check the other one was okay superficially okay hey, you're breathing Huh? Yeah, you're breathing. Have you got everything you need? Um, and then on Christmas Day, we was we worked out we were so lonely because we we'd um, we'd contacted our families on Christmas Day and they were all at home opening presents and eating you know real food. And they, had a, <laughs> they had a real flushing toilet instead of a bucket, <laughs> which is all we had. Um, and uh, yeah, we both just burst into tears because um, we were we were hurting because we hadn't slept and you know the food was terrible and we were missing our kids and um, and uh, yeah, we just we had a big cry and a big hug and just said you know we haven't spoken for two weeks. This is insane. <laughs> and and um, I say in, in in my talks that that's that's the that was the day we became a team. And yeah. After that, you know, we 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 conversed all the time, really checked in on each other, um, and there are a lot. I'm 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 changing my talk at the moment because there are so many parallels to EOS. So, oh, for sure. Oh, I mean, honestly, um, I can't wait till it's finished because, you know, I mean, talk about an issues list. Um, you had we, one. <laughs> I mean, we really had to dig to find uh, to find the root cause of some of those issues, um, mm -hmm. and 
and um, uh, where was I with that? Oh yeah, we just became we just became a team that day, and we and, and we decided that we would have breakfast together every morning, so that you know we had a it was like a daily L ten, mm -hmm. um, and it was it was amazing. Um, that's awesome yeah, so what would be the third lesson uh the third i think the third although i mentioned it within probably both the first and the second i think the third is perspective yeah uh it's a really tricky one because yeah we all know that it it, it has to be relative you know we can't wake up on a daily basis and think about, you know, the, the poor people of Ukraine or, you know, the, uh, the famine in the Sudan, um, because it's not, it's not relative to us. It doesn't actually make us feel any better about right. problems we're facing. Um, but, but actually seeing that migrant dinghy and, and also, uh, there was another, um, again, I, I have a photo in my talk, um, of these four veterans who did three tours of Afghanistan and they all lost limbs and they rode in the same race as us as a, as a four man team. Mm -hmm. And, you know, one of them had no legs and they were all missing a limb and they rode across the Atlantic. Wow. And so, you know, there are, you know, I was, there were times where, you know, when we signed up for it, I, I couldn't help. I, I like to think I'm a, a, a relatively humble guy, but there was definitely a bit of swagger once I'd signed up for this. You know, hey, did I hear you're rowing the Atlantic? Yeah, I'm rowing the Atlantic. Man. Yeah, right. Um, <laughs> feeling pretty good about myself, and Sorry. then and then I see these these veterans without limbs, and they're doing it, and I'm thinking, okay, now that's right. cool. Yeah. Uh, that's rough yeah yeah so i think i think those those are the top three also i mean sorry i'm going to make the list longer but goal setting is another massive one you know mm -hmm. i mean we really set our sights high um and there was a massive uh possibility that we would fail so sure. uh, and we just we were at peace with that we just said look let's set the bar high and if we don't make it, you know, we're not young. Half of these teams are, you know, in their twenties. If we don't make it, you know, we've had a good crack. Um, we've met some fantastic people. You know, we can say, you know, we got halfway. Um, and, and that's how you learn, right? You, you learn from, you learn from doing, trying, falling over, getting back up. Yeah, which I'm sure you experienced daily. Yeah, during that, that adventure. Uh, there's a great, I love this Japanese saying, um, fall down seven times, get up eight. Mm -hmm. so, um, yeah, yeah, we did. There, there were learnings every day. And Mark, honestly, there's not a day that goes by where I do not think about the road. Yeah. Um, for the last two days, I've been networking at a conference uh, at the NEC in Birmingham. And, you know, biz dev is, is it can be pretty brutal. Um, yeah. A lot of doors getting shut in your face and you have to just keep, be, you know, keep maintaining this abundance mindset. But yeah, after, for sure. After a day and a half, you know, you're thinking my resilience is wearing thin. And at that point, I just thought I rode the Atlantic. I, I can do I can have another okay. conversation. You know, it's, you know. Right. Rowing the Atlantic's not going to, you know, pay the mortgage, but, you know, I'll, I'll be all right. Yeah, so, yeah, for sure. It's good. Yeah. I mean, what an amazing story. Uh, I appreciate your, uh, your, the lessons there, and I'm sure everyone else will too. Yeah, yeah, I hope so. Um, I always worry that, that, it, that it, it can come across as quite preachy, but honestly... They're just my personal lessons, you know, people will take them or leave them as they will. Um, yeah, it, it was, it was a journey.
Yes, it is a journey. <laughs> Everything <laughs> is, is now, now a journey. Now on the EOS journey. That's right. I mean, it's really the same, as you said, is that for entrepreneurs growing their businesses, you're when you think you're done, you're not done. It requires tremendous amount of teamwork and you got to have perspective because if you don't and you're comparing yourself to these billion dollar unicorn businesses and that can be like, you know, something wrong with me. I'm not good enough. But the reality is you're on your own journey. It's not about the comparison game. It's about just getting up, being 1% better, or in your case, just get up have breakfast, row for two hours, <laughs> yeah. and then do it over again until at one point you'll reach the goal. Yeah. So, yeah. Yeah, no. That's I, a... I couldn't agree more that there are, there are so many uh, analogies with, with, with entrepreneurial organizations. Um, you, you, you feel like it's constant, constant waves. Occasionally you get one that you surf with. But most of the time, you know, you're you're getting hit by them rather than enjoying them. Every now and again, you you know, you, there's a tsunami. Um, yeah. You, you just have to keep getting back up. You know, staying positive and, like you say, um, being resilient, and eventually you get there. Amazing. Yeah. Well, on that note, Tim, I appreciate the. The time and the story and uh we'll see you until next time yeah thanks mark good to speak yeah